Good evening. Welcome to a, another uh, year of history with the Tolpala Radical History Group. This is the first uh, session we're running in 2021. Um, we're very fortunate tonight to have uh, Janine Booth with us. I first met Janine at uh, the Match Women's Festival, the very first Match Women's Festival, when we shared a platform. And Janine asked me if she could come to Tolpala to talk about this topic. Uh, and unfortunately, since that date, we've not had a, a, a theme which I could fit Janine in, but she's always been in the back of my mind because I remember meeting her. Um, this is the first of several sessions we're running this year, all the way through to uh, July. Uh, all of them are exciting. We'll give you some more news about those as we, uh, as we go along. Uh, we've now got 44 people join us. If you would like to uh, say hello and where you're from in the chat box, that would be absolutely fantastic. Hello, Danny in Plymouth. Good to see you there. That's Danny Riley from the Mayflower Man Mavericks. I know Danny. Uh, if you've got questions, could you please put them into uh, the Q&A session? Um, uh, the Q&A box is at the bottom of your screen. Don't put them into the chat. Just put into the chat where you're from. Say hello. That's absolutely fantastic. If you do put questions in there, I'll try and pick them up. Uh, Kevin from Fearings there, the Forest of Dean, uh, York, London. I'm beginning to see those coming in there. People all over the world. Thank you very much. Bristol, Cambridge. Excellent. Uh, there's 47 of you. I think 55 people have... Uh, I've signed up for this session, which is a really, really good number. Bournemouth, York, Hartford, Lancaster. Evening to you, Hillary. Uh, Bellingham in Washington State. There we are in America. Excellent. David Harlow, London, Alex. Well, uh, London, Alex. Um, um, sorry, that one leapt up on me. Keith and Isabel from Murphy in Warwickshire. Welcome to all of you. Welcome, as always, to the Radical History School. Can I just lay down a few uh, ground rules? Uh, please be polite to everybody, particularly the panellists, which in this case is me and Janine. And uh, please be polite to each other. Greetings from Tavistock. Um, from iPad. Hello, iPad. Nice to see you. Uh, <laughs> if you. If you could be polite to each other and uh, follow the general rules of decency and common sense, we're going to get along fine. Uh, what's going to happen tonight is Janine is going to talk about the Poplar Rates Rebellion 1919 to 1925. Is that right, Janine? And... Hopefully That's right, but I'm, main, I'm mainly going to talk about 1921 as it's the centenary. Okay, mainly talking about 1921. And uh, Janine is going to uh, talk about 40 minutes. If you've got questions, we will take those at the end and I will pose the questions for you. And please remember to put your questions into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, okay, where it says Q&A. If you put your questions into there, that would be absolutely fantastic. And I will keep an eye on that as we go along. So it's my great pleasure... Uh, as the organiser of the Top Puddle Radical History Group, uh, to welcome uh, Janine Booth. And I pass over to you, Janine. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much for letting me uh, in, indulge myself in one of my uh, favourite topics um, to tell you about the Poplar Council Rates Rebellion of 1921. Um, and as you'll have noticed, if you're a sharp mathematician, uh, that, was that was 100 years ago this year. So this year, as I will mention later, there's a whole program of events going on, uh, marking that centenary, not just as a kind of historical nicety, but because it for sure has lots of lessons for us today. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this by PowerPoint. Don't think that just because you're on Zoom and not in real life that you, that you escape from the dreaded PowerPoint, um, but it, at least it means you get to look at lots of pictures of what happened in Poplar rather than just looking at me and my uh, replica banner behind me look out for that banner in the in the uh photos later on okay so here we go hopefully this is going according to plan you can all see in front of you a screen on your screen a screen that says guilty and proud of it um including a, a, a cover of my book. Sneak in a little plug for that there. Um, the story of Poplar's rebel councillors and guardians, 1919 to 1925. But as already mentioned, as it's the centenary year, I'm going to be focusing this talk on what happened in 1921. But a bit of background first. First of all, Poplar. Where is Poplar? Well, there's Poplar on your map. There's your map of London. There's that big loop in the river that you see on the uh, opening screen of EastEnders. Um, and Poplar 
is an East London Dockland area. So it's part of London and it's a part uh, that is the southern part in particular around the docks. It's a total area, it's about two and a third thousand acres. The population at the time we're talking about was 160,000. Now, this means that it's about a third of the size of a current London borough. So this area is about a third of what now constitutes Tower Hamlets borough, but not far short of the population of um, a, a present day London borough. So massively, densely overcrowded. 24% of the population lived in a poverty officially. And given you had to be really, really, really poor to qualify as officially poor, that shows you what a poor borough it, it was. Infant mortality, out of every thousand babies, 83 of them died. And over 33,000 people lived in overcrowded housing. Now, at the time, the measure for overcrowded housing was more than two people per room. So if you pause for a second, count up the number of rooms in your house. Okay, double that. That figure there, if that many people lived in your house, it would still not be overcrowded. You'd have to have another person move in in order to make it officially overcrowded. And yet over 33,000 people lived like that. In terms of uh, what people did for a living, over a quarter of the men worked in transport. That would be either on the docks, on the railways, transporting mainly transporting goods to and from the docks. And over half of women worked for wages, which was um, significantly higher than average. OK, so after the First World War, there was a series of elections. And these elections were really significant because they happened after the 1918 Representation of the People Act. And that was the Act of Parliament that brought nearly universal suffrage. And I say nearly because it enfranchised women over the age of 30, subject to a property qualification, but it did enfranchise virtually all men. Unfortunately, the first thing people did with their newly acquired vote was elect a Tory Liberal coalition government at the end of 1918. It was a rush through election, um, hoping to uh, successfully hoping to capitalise on um, war victory euphoria. But as we went into 1919, the newly enfranchised working class voters began to vote uh, more consciously for their own class's representatives. They started to vote for socialist for Labour candidates in local elections. And in the, in the popular council election at the end of 1919, Labour swept the board, um, almost. It won 39 out of 42 seats on the council. And it had also won a majority on the boards of guardians. Now, the boards of guardians were committees that looked after the poor and destitute. What they were supposed to do is put them in workhouses, but Poplar had been breaking that trend for a while by calling by paying people what was then called out relief and what, which would now be called welfare benefits. And the other thing that the 1918 representation of the People Act had done was a thing called pauper enfranchisement. It meant that for the first time, people who received help from the Guardians were allowed to vote for the Guardians. Before, if you received any help, if you were any kind of benefit claimant, as it were, you were then barred from voting. OK, so Poplar elects a whole load of Labour councils, and you can see some of them on this screen here. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you can see my little arrow whizzing around. Maybe you can. Yes, let, uh, my co-host tells me I can. So the guy, the, my little arrow is pointing out there is George Lansbury, who went on to be leader of the Labour Party in the 1930s. That's next to him is his wife, Bessie. Next to her is Sam March. So uh, George Lansbury became the mayor in 1919 and for most of 1920. At the end of 20, Sam March became the mayor and he was the mayor into, 19, um, into 1921. Other people on this picture are John Skur, who went on to be MP, who's up there and Minnie Lansbury, who was my favorite of the councillors, but that's another story altogether. Okay, so here's the important thing though. What did this council do? So popular before, popular council had been run by a coalition of Tories and Liberals, and we all know what that's like. Um, Tories and Liberals and people with financial vested interests in getting contracts for council services and that kind of thing. And Labour, so, but now we had a Labour council and it decided to work on this principle as articulated by George Lansbury, Labour councillors must be different from those we have displaced or why displace them? 
And it has been suggested to me a number of times that we maybe we ought to print that up into a postcard and post it to all our Labour councillors at the moment, uh, just to remind them. Okay, so Poplar Council did a load of really good things to benefit local working class people. It appointed uh, housing inspectors who went round inspecting housing, obviously, private rental sector housing and issuing orders on the landlords to improve the properties. Uh, and if the landlord didn't improve the property, the council did and sent the landlord the bill. It built new housing in the borough for the first time in a long time. It took the TB dispensary. So tuberculosis was known as the white plague. It was a, uh, a horrible disease which caused years of suffering for eventually usually uh, killing the person. It was a, and still is where it still exists, a disease of poverty and a disease of overcrowding. And the only help for people with TB and Poplar up to this point have been a charitable dispensary, a small charity. Poplar Labour Council took it into public control, took it into municipal control and massively expanded it and expanded its services. It began electrifying the borough. This was still a borough 100 years ago that had uh, a lot of its streets lit by gas, a lot of its homes powered by coal, etc. It decasualized work. So popular labor looked at itself, looked at the, the council as an employer and said, how can we improve our employment practices? So people who are on cash and work on the markets and stuff like that were given proper jobs. They brought in a minimum wage of four pound a week, which was quite a lot in those days um, and introduced equal pay for men and women. Um, now that might not sound that radical now, but do bear in mind that it was another 50 years before the law required employers um to pay men and women equal wages and although Labour Party policy was for equal pay for men and women um it does appear that a lot of Labour councils at the time thought Labour Party policy meant something we might aspire to do in the future rather than something that guides our actions now the council expanded maternity and uh, child welfare services and it improved baths and wash houses and when I was researching this, one of my favourite things that I found in the minutes of the council was in the minutes of the Baths and Wash Houses subcommittee, which noted that the subcommittee resolved to heat the second class swim, um, which tells you that there used to be separate swimming sessions for posh people and, uh, and, and for the commoners. And uh, when the commoners swam, uh, the water wasn't heated um, until our fantastic revolutionary champions of the working class decided uh, to heat the second class swim. And there is Poplar Council at the time meeting and going about its business. See the councillors sitting around the tables here. See the mayor there. And one thing you might notice where my arrow is hovering around is the mayor's chain of office. And you might notice that it is not hanging around the mayor. It's hanging around a chair instead because the Labour mayors, uh, George Lansbury onwards, uh, decided that they weren't interested in, in the pomp and, circumstances of, pomp and circumstance of the role. They were interested in doing what their working class electors elected them to do. However, it soon come up against a problem. And the problem was that following a brief post-war boom, uh, we hit an economic crisis. Again, we have some idea about what that's like, don't we? Um, there was a recession. Recession was particularly marked by a uh, collapse in export trade, so it had a particularly harsh effect on a, a Dockland area such as Poplar. And the answer for a lot of Labour councils in particular, a socialist policy that was put forward at the time and should probably still be put forward maybe a bit more boldly now, is for public works, that where you have mass unemployment, there's still work that needs doing. You just need to look around you to see that, don't you? So that there should be public work schemes to get the workers who've been thrown out of work doing work for the public good. Unfortunately, Poplar existed under an unfair funding system, local government funding, um, similar-ish to now um, in London, which is similar elsewhere as well. You have your local council, but you also have a council for the whole of London. Um, like if you're not in London, it might be your local council and your county council. And the local, the local council collects all the, the, the rates, as it was then called. So they, which is a, a form of local property taxation. 
they collect the rates and then they hand over bit, parts of that to London-wide bodies. Um, the problem you have in London in particular was that it distilled out into very rich areas and very poor areas. And yet they all had to provide their services by taxing the people, by rating the people who lived there. Which meant that working class areas, particularly the poorer working class areas, had more demand for their services because remember at the time welfare benefits were a local service as well as all the other stuff that I mentioned. They had a really high demand for their services and yet their residents didn't have the ability to pay the necessary level of rates to deliver their services. Whereas if you're in Westminster, for instance, very little demand for your services, uh, despite a huge ability to pay. So one of the things that socialists were campaigning for at the time and Labour and local government was campaigning for at the time was to equalize the rates. And what they meant by equalize the rates was change the local government funding system so that the rich boroughs put more in and the poor boroughs got more out, that more of the expenses were pooled across rich and poor boroughs. Okay, so they've got a problem now though, because unemployment's gone up massively, so there's a huge demand on Poplar through its board of guardians to provide uh, a safety net welfare for poor residents. And yet the ability of people to pay rates towards that is collapsing as, as so many people are thrown out of work. So Poplar decides it will do a public Works built and um, building roads, not a popular policy on the left now, but it was a very, very important policy 100 years ago when there weren't many roads. Um, and having had a promise from the government to fund that scheme, it cracked on and started it, and then the government backed out. So at this point, Poplar really was in a massive financial crisis. And it had to make a choice. Its choice was to stay within the law which would have meant massively increasing the rates or cutting the services, um, you know, allowing the housing to stay in a dreadful state, not heating a second class swim anymore, uh, not providing the TB services, etc. So staying within the law by massively raising local taxes or cutting services or defying the law. And what Popular Labour did is it got together and it held a conference with delegates from Labour Party and trade union branches from across the borough. And it took a democrat, it thrashed out various ideas for strategies and it made a democratic decision that what the council would do would be, would be to defy the unfair funding system. Because Edgar Lansbury, who was uh, one of the councillors, George Lansbury's son, he explained the rationale behind it like this. He said, the law and justice are two different things. And Sam March, who was the mayor in 1921 said, the masterclass has made the laws. So in March 1921, Poplar Council voted to withhold the precepts to the cross London bodies. So as I just mentioned, when councils charge rates, part of that is for handing over to cross London bodies. So these days it would be to the GLA uh, and the London Fire Brigade and the police probably. In those days, it was to the London County Council and the Metropolitan Asylums Board, which ran some hospitals, the Metropolitan Police and the Metropolitan Water Board. So they voted not to collect and not to pay those precepts because their borough, their working class poor borough, could not afford to do that whilst maintaining the services that they needed locally. Now, as you can imagine, those four bodies weren't very amused by this and um, they took the council to court in order to get their money. And he, here we have a delightful photo, I love this photo, of the signatories. So the London County Council took them to the, the High Court to get the court to give them an instruction to hand over the money. And the council submitted a reply. And these are the five signatories to the reply. You'll notice that four of them are beaming broadly and the other one looks miserable as sin. So. That'll be explained by telling you who they are. That's George Lansbury. That's John Skirr, also a Labour councillor. That's Sam March, the mayor. That's Charlie Sumner, also a Labour councillor who went on to be mayor the following year. The other fella is called Jay Butto Skeggs and he was the town clerk. So he was like the chief civil servant of the council. So he, he didn't like this law breaking business at all, but he did realise that his job was to do what he was told by the council. 
and that he did. Now, while the legal shenanigans were going on, Poplar was mobilizing behind this. This is a really important aspect of this story. This is not just about a couple of dozen martyr rebel councillors. It's about a whole borough taking to the streets, mobilizing, demanding a fairer deal from the local government funding system. And all sorts of odd little court hearings came to a climax on the 29th of July, 1921, uh, where the case was heard in the High Court, and I told you to look out for that banner. There's that banner at the front of that march. The High Court on the Strand, and 5,000 people marched from Poplar to the High Court, which is about five miles. Uh, for those of you familiar with the East End, that's the East India Dock Road that they are marching along there, um, carrying placards and banners that explain the case about why they're marching to court and maybe even to prison. So the court did what the London County Council asked it to. It issued an instruction to the councillors uh, to pay up or else. And or, or else meant, or else you will be found in contempt of court and sent to prison until you do what you are told. And it made that decision at the end of July. And, then, and the judge in rejecting the appeal a couple of days later said that he was gonna give the councillors a month to kind of you know, calm down, consider their position maybe decide to be a little bit less naughty and a little bit more sensible. So of course, the Poplar Council uh, spent the whole of August doing the exact opposite, um, organizing big public meetings all over the borough, even organizing a, a week long fun fair in one of the borough's parks, um, organizing protests, knocking on everyone's doors, talking to people in workplaces, et cetera, et cetera, building up a powerful movement that said they weren't gonna be backed down. And the government, even during, during August, the government did offer a slight tweak. Um, it did offer to, a, a measure of equalisation of the rates. But the councillors and the labour movement of Poplar knew that they could achieve more. They knew that they had mobilised sufficiently and had sufficient power that they weren't prepared to settle for just um, a small improvement. So, on the 1st of September, arrests started. And this really was kind of a bit of theatre in a way. The arrests lasted, were, were done over, over five days. 30 of the councillors were arrested and taken to prison. It remains something of a mystery uh, why those 30 were sent to prison and, the, uh, and, and about a dozen others weren't. Um, it was just, I think, um, sloppiness basically on behalf of the, the prosecuting bodies. But there was a massive mobilisation in defense of the councillors. And in fact, if people had wanted to prevent the councillors being arrested and taken to prison, they would have succeeded, as you can see by the size of the crowd here, outside the house of John and Julia Skur. So uh, as John Skur, that I'm wiggling my little arrow at, and his wife, Julia Skur, next to him, they were both Labour members of Poplar Council. They were both being sent to prison. And this big crowd turned out um, to show their support. And then after some of the men had been arrested, the five of the women councillors were arrested. And they actually made an appointment with the sheriff to all meet up at the town hall and all get arrested together there. And this is my very favorite photograph um, of all the photographs I'm gonna show you. Uh, this is Minnie Lansbury arriving to be arrested. And what I love about this photo is it, it, it's got a sense of movement, it's got a sense of determination. It's got people helping each other. There's the chap trotting along behind her with her, with her suitcase on his shoulder, the woman reaching out to, to shake her hand. Um, it, just, it just glows with solidarity, doesn't it? And if you look up at the top left, you'll see that the streets were so packed that people were even sitting on the walls in order to get a glimpse of the women councillors. Um, and there we can see just one section of the crowds who, who were waiting for the women councillors to, to see them off. And someone called out in, in the assembly, can't we at least stop the women uh, being arrested and taken to prison? And Susan Lawrence, who was one of the women councillors said, don't you dare, we've got as much right to go to prison for what we believe in as the blokes have. And that's what happened. But before they went off to prison, the women councillors gave speeches to the assembled crowds from, that's where my little arrow is there, the balcony of the town hall, popular town hall, building doesn't exist anymore I'm afraid it was uh, flattened in the blitz 
but they're up there giving their speech to these assembled throngs. Um, there's the crowd listening to Nellie Kressel, who was one of the councillors um, who was being sent to prison despite being um, nearly eight months pregnant. Um, Julia Skirr, she's actually in the sheriff's car there, about to be driven away to prison, and she's telling the crowds, we won't surrender. And you'll also see on the placard behind her, no rent strike. So the government had threatened, or at least considered, or had been urged by its supporters, the opponents of what Poplar was doing, to send in a substitute authority and take over Poplar and collect the money and hand it over. And often now, if uh, you know, councillors will say, "Well, hang on, if we, you know, if we refuse to make cuts or do anything illegal, the government will just send in commissioners to take over." And you know, that's a very real problem. But the government were threatening that at the time. And what the popular labour movement had done was organised street by street, area by area, that people were going to have a rent strike if that happened. So the substitute authority wouldn't be able to collect anybody's. Uh, rent at all because everyone would be refusing to pay it. You'll notice also that the uh, the masthead on that placard is the Daily Herald and it's worth mentioning the Daily Herald. It's a socialist newspaper, a national newspaper, the circulation of over a quarter of a million at the time. And his editor was George Lansbury, <coughs> who by this point was in prison and um, who eventually through sheer stubbornness persuaded the prison to let him carry on editing the Daily Herald during, uh, from prison while he was in there. Okay, so the women councillors are in the car. They're about to be taken off to prison. There they are. That's so my, my little arrow there's putting Minnie Lansbury at the back. And you have Nellie Kressel and Jenny McKay and Julia Skirr. Um, you have the five women councillors, Susan Lawrence, all being taken off to Holloway Prison. And um, I'm not saying the sheriff was sympathetic to their cause at all, but he drove at like four miles an hour to the edge of the, board, the, the borough boundary. So the massive crowds could keep marching with them. Um, and then when they departed from the borough boundary, he took them for dinner before taking them to the prison. So off they all went to prison. So what's happening in prison then? Okay, so 25 male councillors were incarcerated in Brixton Prison, five women councillors in Holloway Prison. The pr prison conditions were dreadful, really bad, inedible food, horrible discomfort. Several of the councillors ended up in the hospital wings of the, of, of the uh, prison within a very short period of time. But their supporters carried on supporting them and the movement kept on mobilising. So every night, there were assembled crowds of people at both the prisons singing and chanting their support. They held meetings outside the prison. George Lansbury even spoke at one of these meetings through the, uh, through the bars of his prison cell window. And uh, when, when a couple of days later, the prison authorities offered to move him to a more comfortable cell, a larger, more comfortable, much more pleasant cell in the, in, in the interior of the prison, he said no, because he wouldn't then be able to deliver his speeches to the, the, the marches. And a couple of times a week, there were big marches from the borough uh, to Holloway prison as well. And um, local union branches, local labor parties would be involved in building them. So um, meanwhile, you might be asking yourself what the London Labour Party was doing. Now the London, this is quite interesting. The secretary of the London Labour Party was a chap by the name of Herbert Morrison. And Herbert Morrison was the literal and political uh, grandfather of Peter Mandelson. Um, so he was at the time mayor of neighbouring Hackney Borough and he uh, didn't like this misbehaviour at all. He didn't like this rule breaking or whatsoever. He thought Labour councils should be proving um, how well behaved they are and how they can be trusted with the people's finances, um, etc. So he said, no, we in order to tackle this unfair funding system and to deal with unemployment and poverty and recession, what we need to do is seek an audience with Lloyd George, who was the prime minister. Um, what made it slightly awkward for Herbert Morrison was that Lloyd George was on a recuperative break in the Scottish Highlands in a place called Gairlock. So off went Herbert Morrison up to the Scottish Highlands to track down Lloyd George and demand an audience with him. He got an audience with him, but he didn't get anything out of him in terms of policy measures that would benefit the unemployed, 
um, that would help uh, tackle the impact of the recession or that would address the unfair funding policy. Now, the councillors continued to organise in prison, so they demanded better conditions and they got better conditions. And then, believe it or not, they managed to persuade the authorities to let them meet as a council in prison. And the minutes of those meetings still exist. So if you go to Tower Hamlet's um, local history library and archive, you can look in the minute book of Poplar Council and you can read minutes that says Poplar Borough Council meeting held on the 21st of September 1921 in George Lansbury's cell number five, HM Prison, Brixton. And what's remarkable about these mi minutes isn't just that, you know, the council met in George Lansbury's cell number five in Brixton Prison, but what the agenda was, because it started off with the prison conditions and then it moved on to the campaign for their release and their campaign for rape sequelization. They noted that there were lots of window posters up in one part of the borough, not enough in another part of the borough and that kind of thing. And then it did the mundane business of the council. So there's an item on the agenda of one of these meetings, which is rat infestation on Ellathorpe Street. So the councillors were still, they were still addressing those uh, mundane, day-to-day, -day, but important, essential issues of working class quality of life that they were elected to address. But you might be asking yourself now, hang on, this recession is affecting everyone, and this unfair local government funding system is affecting every poor borough, or at the very least every other poor working class borough in London. Where are all the other councils? Why aren't the other councils um, taking the same stand as Poplar did? And a lot of them kind of wished Poplar well, but then, but, but didn't take the same action themselves. But then eventually, when the councillors had been in prison three or four weeks, finally, two neighbouring councils, Bethnal Green and Stepney, voted to do the same as Poplar. They voted to withhold the precepts to the cross London bodies. And um, that's, a, that's a picture there of the Mayor and Deputy Mayor of Bethnal Green. Um, in Stepney Council, the motion to withhold the precepts was proposed by um, a young up and coming alderman uh, who, who went on to make quite a name for himself. His name was, his name was Clement Attlee. And it was the first and only time that he did something kind of radical and illegal. Um, but he said, usually I'm a constitutionalist, but there comes a time when you have to kick. And so he proposed that. So let's add all this together, okay? You've got a defiant council, which is not backing down, not carrying out its instruction from the court. You've got mass mobilization of a borough uh, that is marching, that is threatening to hold its, uh, withhold its rent, uh, that is cheering on its councillors, that, that, that momentum is showing no sign of waning. And now you've got two other councils joining the fray as well. Under that pressure, the council won. The government backed down. And in the middle of October 1921, they became the first people in English legal history. Here's a fun fact for you legal nerds. The first people in English legal history to be released from imprisonment for contempt of court without having first purged their contempt. If you're sent to prison for contempt of court, you're meant to stay there until you do the thing that the court's been telling you to do. Um, but they were released instead to attend a conference at which um, reform of the rating system was going to be discussed. So you can see this. So this. So the, the women were released from Holloway and they were taken in the car to Brixton where the men were released. And this is a photograph outside the walls of Brixton prison. And let's take my little arrow around. There's George Lansbury there. You might notice that virtually all the men have got moustaches. Some haven't. That's Edgar Landry. He hasn't. And he, here's one for you TUC types. OK, this, I don't know if you know who this chap at the front is. So this chap at the front is not one of the councillors. He's the councillor's lawyer, the councillor's solicitor. And his name is W.H. Thompson. And at exactly the same time, honestly, exactly the same month that this photo was taken, W.H. Thompson set up his legal firm. Um, which is also therefore celebrating its centenary this year from its office on the fifth floor of the TUC's Congress House. Uh, so yeah, that is Thompson as, as of Thompson's. 
And in fact, the uh, the councillors were so uh, happy with Thompson and, you know, the stall representation he gave them, impossible task, you know, legally defending people who had broken the law, um, that they presented him with a, an album of photos. And these photos I've been showing you are from that, from that album of photos. Okay, so off they go back to Poplar. There they are, there they are at their victory rally in Victoria Park. And there's that banner again, what had they won? Okay, so they had this conference. And as a result of the conference, um, a law was passed through parliament called the Local Authorities Financial Provisions Act 1921. And what that did is it introduced cross London pooling of outdoor relief costs. So that's welfare benefit payments up to scales levels figures set by the Minister of Health. And Poplar gained from this to, uh, to over £250,000 a year, over a quarter of a million pound a year. Now, if I told you that was in today's money, that would be still be quite a lot of money, wouldn't it? But that's in 1921 money. So that's a massive, massive amount of money. Um, and other poor boroughs uh, gained as well. And um, I think it's probably the last thing in this slideshow. This is, so this is a quote, um, okay. Describing this victory as, this is a great discouragement to those who believe in constitutional action and a great encouragement to those who believe in revolutionary methods. And that's a quote uh, from a fellow called J.H. Thomas, who was General Secretary of the National Union of the Railwaymen at the time. Um, and, uh, and, and was also a Labour MP. And when he says that, I agree with him, except he thinks that's a bad thing. Uh, whereas I think it's a good thing. He was very critical of the popular councillors, despite the fact that several of them were reps, branch secretaries, active members of his own trade union. But yes, great discouragement to those who believe in constitutional action and great encouragement to those who believe in revolutionary methods. So that brings us to the end of 1921, and it brings us to the end of uh, this talk of mine. I seem to have done it pretty much exactly in the time available to me, leaving myself two minutes just to plug this year. Okay, so this year it's the centenary um, of the Poplar Rates Rebellion. I hope you agree that it's a fascinating and inspiring story, but I hope also that certain things have jumped out at you from the screen about parallels today uh, with today, um, you know, Tory Liberal coalition governments, unfair local council funding system, poor housing. Um, you know, maybe there's even a parallel between TB and coronavirus um, and the need for public health care. There's certainly lots of lessons for us today about how uh, what the approach that Labour ought to take in local government. It's been very sad to see um, Labour councils, including the Labour council in the area where Poplar is, in conflict with their trade unions, pursuing policies like firing and rehiring them, rather than policies such as those that Poplar Council took. But before I go off on one into that, um, I'm gonna stop and thank you for listening and uh, hopefully answer some of your questions. Thank you, Janine. That's brilliant. What a great way to start the year. Thank you very much. Uh, a revolutionary call the way that you, which you start the year. Uh, we do have three questions for you that come in, Janine. We'll take them as they came in. Is there any evidence that Clara Zetkin sent greetings to the strikers? Uh, not that I've seen. And I'm, I'm, reasonably okay, confident, I'm reasonably confident that if there were, I'd have seen it. The second question is, uh, follows up from something you just said about, uh, you know, the, the links between what happened then and what happened today. And the question is, were these events an inspiration for the rate capping rebellion of 1985? And why were the popular councillors of 1921 willing to go to prison in a way that Labour councillors in 1985 were not? Oh, that's a, a good question. question. That, I think. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to answer, is, answer that. Yeah. I'm going to answer that by telling you how I got interested in this subject. Okay, because I. I used to live in Hackney, in, in, in East London. I, I, I don't anymore, I live in Sussex now. Um, and back in 2000-ish, uh, the Labour Council in Hackney was making a bunch of cuts. It was trying to uh, privatise the estate I live on. I lived on at the time, and it was closing various things. It was closing nurseries that my 
at the nursery that my two-year-old son, a uh, one-year-old son, attended at the time. And I was involved in fighting against those cuts. And I got, in, I got into an argument um, on the letters pages of the Hackney Gazette, the local newspaper, with the then uh, Labour whip on Hackney Council, a chap by the name of Luke Akehurst, who some of you might have heard of, who's just been elected onto the uh, Labour Party National Executive. Um, and Luke was arguing in his letters, he was saying, look, we don't like making these cuts, but we don't have any choice. And I was replying saying, well, it's no consolation to kids whose nurseries have been closed, whether you like making them or not. But in any case, you do have a choice. But I realised after a bit of, you know, Hackney Gazette letters page ping pong, that my argument would be stronger if I could point to an example of a Labour council that had made a different choice, that had chosen to defy an unfair system rather than bow down to it. Now, I, I, was, I was aware of the struggles over rate capping in the 1980s. Obviously, I was, you know, very young at the time. Well, I was a teenager at the time, um, but I was aware of them. And I, I was aware that they had gone some of the way down the Poplar Road, but not all of the way down the Poplar Road. Um, it, when I say that bit about what happened in August 1921 in Poplar, where they were offered, um, you know, some concessions and they didn't back down, that's the point at which I think the equivalent in the 1980s was was the the deals and agreements that the councils did come to there. Having they'd won something, but they hadn't gone the whole way. So that's why I, when I started burying my head in uh, local history se uh, sections of local libraries, and I found out about the Poplar Council Rate Rebellion. Um, so I, I know that's a kind of an about face way of answering that question, but I hope I hope no, it's fine. That's, I hope that's it a great answer. answer. Thank you. I think it was an incredibly good question. We've got four questions, but several of you will now see that Apsana Begum has joined us. Apsana, uh, Apsana might have frozen there for a minute. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself? I know you wanted to say a few words. Thank you so much, Les, and thank you so much, Janine. Um, I've missed quite a bit of this. A session but I'm going to uh, come back to watch it and what a lovely banner you've got there Janine um, it's it's really lovely I need to get myself one of those thank you so much for having me on this call and thank you to everyone that's spoken so far um, just a few things really look I just wanted to say that you know the story of the Poplar Rates strike is one that is incredibly inspiring to me um, and um, you know the the radical councillors who are involved in the strike really went against the odds to get elected in the first place um, that they then had to resolve to stick to their beliefs once in, in that position is, is even more uh, inspiring. Um, the bill that was eventually rushed through Parliament is testament to the fact that actions have consequences and that if we stick to our political values, we can all create change. Uh, now, I was elected as an MP in 2019. I was elected as a Labour MP. I was elected on Labour's Radical Manifesto, a plan to change the lives of so many working people in our country who have been continually stamped upon throughout 10 years of Tory government. I was proud to be elected on that manifesto, a socialist manifesto, and I'll continue to use my position in Parliament to advance the aims of socialism the best I can. Not only this, but I will use this position to fight for the constituency that I was born in and that I've lived in my entire life. Um, Poplar and Limehouse is a vibrant multicultural community. Uh, that to me shows the, the best and the worst of our society. This constituency has a history of multicultural, radical political action, so often challenging those structures, those power structures that exploit those from less fortunate backgrounds and those from minority backgrounds as well. Um, and Poplar Nymas is still one of the most impoverished areas in the country. The London borough of Tower Hamlets has the highest rate of child poverty in London, one of the highest across the country. 57% of children in the borough live in poverty. And as well as this, 44% of households live in income poverty, with Poplar Ward itself being particularly low in terms of the median wages at 23,243. The inequality in my constituency is only highlighted further by the fact that Canary Wharf towers above much of Poplar. It's a constant reminder of those who are rich and powerful and those who live in wealth at the detriment of those who clean their buildings, who drive their trains, who, who drive their taxis, who work in their supermarkets. Um, and of course, this is this, you know, this is not new information, um, but it is, however, uh, the backdrop to why I became an MP. And, and ho I hope that by taking uh, radical action in Parliament, I can in some way 
following the footsteps, dare I say, of George Lansbury and those others in the popular rates strike. In Parliament, I've continually voted with my conscience. And in doing so, I voted against the government bills that would legalise torture, forms of spying, as well as, you know, not, you know, abstaining on the Brexit uh, uh, bill. I'll do um, all that I can to use my elected position within an establishment to incite change alongside my parliamentary colleagues in the Labour Party and in the Socialist Campaign Group of MPs. For me, what's really so important about the, the popular rates strikers is the idea of, of having radical voices within our political institutions. And that's really, really important. During those years where Jeremy Corbyn was leading uh, the Labour Party, that sort of thing felt much more achievable and much more possible than it had previously. Um, but it's when considering you know, the popular rate strikes that I feel particularly humbled by those radical voices that have gone before me and paved the way uh, you know, um, MPs such as Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonald and Abbott have been pushing a socialist agenda in Parliament for years, uh, when that was an incredibly unpopular position in the mainstream. But we're in the mainstream now. Um, and this is, you know, the position that people are trying to fight against this, the socialist vision, the socialist position. Uh, we now have a stronger cohort of socialist MPs than ever before. And that is one of the legacies of Jeremy's leadership. And I hope um, will be uh, strong in guiding the direction of the Labour Party in years to come. I'm going to stop there. Um, and apologies that I will have to leave uh, for eight o'clock, um, but I will listen in for, for the few more minutes that I have left. Thank you. Thanks very much, Absalom. That's very good. I, when I started this, or when Nigel Cossey and I started this, Nigel's in the background, you can't see him. I don't think we ever thought that uh, we'd have MPs and uh, uh, lords and ladies talking to us, and also that we'd become an international uh, history school on a Tuesday night. I mean, I'm here in Cornwall. I'm a Londoner by birth. Uh, and uh, I think all every working person in this country owes a debt to those working people who went before us, who uh, put their lives and reputations on the line uh, to achieve uh, a newfound freedoms for working class people. I think that's very important. Um, I hadn't prepared that in any way, so I'm just uh, vocalising something I feel very strongly. That's why I, as a historian, am very interested in radical history, because, you know, if ever I'm asked about what's the most important thing we can do, the most important thing we can do is to vote, because people gave their lives for people like you and I to have the vote. I think it's very important. So thanks for coming on tonight. We've got some other questions here for you, Janine. I'm going to try and take those. Uh, from how far afield did trades councils come to support the popular strike? Do we know, was it national support or basically London support or... Sorry, could you say that again? I didn't catch the first how far, bit. From how far afield did people come, trades councils come, to support the popular strike? Ah, well, I mean, one thing that's quite interesting is it was national news. Um, so yeah. there are there were reports of it, not just in national newspapers, but in local newspapers in like Scotland and and the southwest and and, and stuff like that. Because partly because it was just this big drama, um, and also because of the, you know, working class people like to see people fighting back, don't they? We like to they see do. fighting back in our own interests. So yeah, there were there were motions of being su support being sent all over the place. Um, one day I might compile a list because they were printed every day in the Daily Herald, a list of all the organisations that had sent messages of support, and they were from all over the country. And they were also running a fund to help look after the councillors' children, um, and donations to that came in, including you know lots of tiny donations of people just giving the only couple of pennies that they could afford in in order to help that and in terms of just mentioning the council's kids I should mention I mentioned before that Nellie Cressel was nearly eight months pregnant okay She's nearly eight months pregnant her and her husband George were both amongst the prisoners and she was pregnant with her eighth child so she was leaving, leaving they were leaving seven children outside of prison to be cared for by their friends and comrades and that shows I think the level of trust and community and comradeship that existed between people in the popular labour movement that, that Nellie and George felt um, felt able to do that. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is really easy. Are all the pictures you've shown us tonight in your book? Oh, my book. Funny you should mention my book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think they are. And some more as well, I think. Oh, there's some the, yeah, there's some of the people aren't there. So the, the book you can get from my website, janineboo.com. Okay, 
Nigel Wiskins just put up Janine. That's his question. There you are. Ah, so that's um, Ni Nigel. Nigel is uh, is a descendant of George Lansbury. Right. There is a, there's another descendant here tonight as well. Terry Murphy, who's the great nephew of Albert Baker, who was a former mayor. Oh. So Fantastic. there you are. Hello. And there's also Nigel. I think. I think I've noticed Chris Sumner on the call, who is uh, yeah. grand grandson of Charlie Sumner and of Albert Eastfield, who was one of the Labour councillors no. who wasn't sent to prison. And I've spotted Stephen Warren, who is the great nephew of Nellie and George Cressel. Fantastic. So it's a family gathering. Mm. Janine, do you happen to know how Patrick Connolly was related to James Colony? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know either. No, I'm, I'm, I, no, I'm, I'm not sure about that. No. I don't know the answer to that either. Uh, uh, Mini, uh, then from Hilary Tudor, Minnie Lansbury died in 1922. Was this as a result of her imprisonment? What other personal consequences there, were there for jailed councillors? Very, very good question. And I, I told you before, didn't I, that, that, that she was my favourite councillor. Um, it took me three years to write that book, so three years of researching. And when you write about 30 Labour councillors for three years, you feel like they've all moved into your house. Uh, yeah. You feel like they're all okay. living with you. And the one I fell in love with was Minnie Lansbury. Um, so I, I carried on researching more about her and she's, she's a fascinating character. She was born in the, uh, in the East End within, uh, within a few yards of the, the massive brewery that was in, that in Whitechapel, it probably smelt terrible around there. Um, she was born there of Jewish immigrant parents who had only just arrived from uh, Polish Russia, fleeing czarist anti-Semitism. Um, she, she, uh, she carried on at school into her teens, which was, you know, not common for working class girls in those days. And she qualified as a teacher. Um, she was one of the first wave of non-Christian people even allowed to become teachers. Um, in the East End. She, she, she studied at the, the school. It was called Coburn School for Girls at the time. It was in the building which is now Central Foundation Girls School, um, which those of you from the East End will know what I'm talking about. Um, and she was the youngest of the 30, the, uh, the, the 30 councillors who were sent to prison. But she did end up in the hospital wing within a, within a few days and she became quite ill in, 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 in prison. She was released with the others in... Um, in the middle of October and she went back to her duties as a counsellor. She had a bit of a holiday to Switzerland with her husband Edgar, came back. But then over Christmas she caught the flu and uh, the flu turned into pneumonia and on New Year's Day 1922 she died at the age of 32. Tens of thousands of people turned out to her funeral. Uh, she was much, much loved in the East End of London. It was a secular funeral. It had a vicar doing one bit, it had a rabbi doing another bit. Um, Everybody was welcome, lots of labor movement banners there, et cetera, but an absolute tragedy. And yes, I, I don't think the flu would have killed an otherwise healthy 32 year old woman if she had not just spent six weeks in Holloway prison. I, my, I, I think, um, by, I'm not an epidemiologist, but my guess is that that wave of flu, that the little, the little um, a few cases flew around that time, was actually the third final and lowest wave of the Spanish flu coming back. Yeah. So the Spanish flu at the end of the First World War in 1918 came back again, winter 19, then winter 20, and then just a little bit 1921. And it wouldn't have, it w I don't think it would have, and, and George Lansbury didn't think it would have killed her if she hadn't been in prison. Um, Sam March also had to go off for recuperation after prison, and George Lansbury attributed the uh, early ish deaths of at least two of the other councillors to their time in prison. Tell that. so this this wasn't this wasn't a jolly holiday in you know like the daily mail likes us to think prisons are like doesn't it everyone's sitting in there watching telly and then you know having a laugh at the taxpayers expense it wasn't that at all it's a huge personal sacrifice that they made it certainly was um you know I, i'm really interested in the response from uh, lloyd george because he came back out of the First World War, and this is just after the First World War, uh, the start of this great economic crisis in the 1920s. Lloyd George had come back and won the election, basically uh, promising homes fit for heroes, a bright new future for working classes, soldiers returning. Look at the pictures you've got there. There's lots of young men or youngish men who would have been in the trenches who have come back to London. And yet Lloyd George wants nothing to do with this. 
Is that right? They even they went up to Scotland to see him. He wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. Yeah, absolutely. And a, a, a lot of uh, working class anger in, into 1919, 1920, 1921 was expressed around, uh, discussed with Lloyd George at his empty promises of a land fit for heroes, um, that he could make speeches like that, but then actually preside over a, a system where profiteers continue to get rich off the back of working people um, while... Um, you know, everyone likes to praise the ex-service uh, people like, like they do now, but didn't do anything to stop them having to sit in gutters selling matchboxes just to get enough money to feed themselves with. So, yeah, a lot of anger about uh, the government letting people down. Oh, there goes another parallel Absolutely. with today. Absolutely. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a link with today. Uh, from John Partington, was Councillor Ada Salter and the Bermondsey Labour movement supportive and involved? Maybe, Maybe. Not, not, <laughs> not in a massively high profile way. That might be something we could, we could dig out and have a look at. Thank you very much. Well, it, it, we're coming to the end of our, of our session. We've got three or four minutes left. Um, I've got one more question for you. I think Nigel's I'm, got his hand up. Nigel's think... got his hand up. Nigel, can we hear you? Are you there? Yes, you can hear me. Janine, what a brilliant talk. That was fantastic. The yeah. best I've, I've heard about this wonderful period of history. And my goodness, don't we need to press on with this kind of... Oh. Oh, no. He's dropped out in mid-flow of praising me as well. Oh, in mid-flow. Mid Nigel, are you there? We're going to try and re-establish the link with you. He's back. Nigel, can you come back? Are you there? I can't see your hand up anymore, Nigel, to be honest with you. He, he, he's back in the room. He's back in the room. Can you, un can you unmute off. yourself, Nigel? Oh, well. Here I can. Oh, don't, we don't, we need to, uh, don't we need to find a way of making this wonderful sort of protest about so many of the awful things that are going on at the moment. I mean, I'm an old, I'm an old geezer and I've finished, but um, so many things make me angry. Thank no, you. Thank no, you, Janine. Thank You're you. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. I have to say, Janine, the comments uh, you've had in the chat box tonight have been absolutely inspiring. Thank you very much for arranging the event. Janine, yeah, it was fascinating and inspiring, well delivered. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Uh, all the sort of comments that are there in the chat box are absolutely fantastic. Uh, and, and you deserve praise for, for what you've done for us all tonight. So thank you very, very much indeed for that. A lot of, uh, a lot of chat about Liverpool and, and them standing up against uh, the governments uh, of the past. Uh, someone was there from Liverpool talking about that earlier which I've now lost, as is always the way. Oh, Liverpool mobilised the people, the unions back, and we marched to uh, London and demonstrated at the High Court. We spoke up and down the country and supported other councils regularly, went up to Lambeth. Liverpool was the last council to hold out. So, Can you see my reply comment underneath? No, I haven't seen your reply. Do you want to add to that? I can't see a reply to that. Uh, the reply the union No, 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 no. It's further up than that. Um, okay. So my reply is, yeah, look, Liverpool did go further than other councils in the 80s in defying the Tories and in mobilising, etc. But it, did, it didn't go the whole road that Poplar did. It didn't. Um, no. it, in the end, it did a deal with the Tory government that fell short of what people were fighting for. Um, you know, whether that's understandable or not, that's a matter of debate, isn't it? Poplar could have done that in August 1921. It could have accepted uh, the concession it wasn't a tiny concession, it was significant, it just wasn't enough. You could have accepted the concession that being offered to her, and I think most people in the Labour movement would have given it a round of applause. But I very much doubt we'd be doing Zoom meetings about it 100 years later. If no. they'd done that. Yeah, we're, okay, doing, the we're doing that now because it went the whole hog. And Liverpool went a long way, but it didn't go the whole hog. OK, this is the last question of the evening then, from Ken Keeble. How much did the Irish situation and the Russian Revolution influence the people of Poplar? Yeah, quite a bit, actually. So one of the important aspects of the popular working class community um, was its immigrant communities. So I've mentioned already Minnie Lansbury being 
uh, from the, the Eastern European Jewish immigrant community. There was also um, a, a strong and active Irish immigrant community, in particular John Skir and Julia Skir were well rooted in that community, uh, which formed um, quite a, a, a big part of this struggle. And the Russian Revolution definitely. So when the Russian Revolution happened, um, particularly when the first 1917 Russian Revolution happened, the whole of the labor movement got behind it. It had a big conference in Leeds in support of the Russian Revolution. A delegation went to that from Poplar, including Edgar Lansbury and George, uh, no, I don't think Duncan made it, um, but several of them, the councillors went up to that. And people were definitely very inspired by that. And it actually wouldn't be quite complete to talk for a whole hour about Poplar without mentioning Sylvia Pankhurst who was also a very strong supporter of um, the Russian Revolution and a, and a supporter of the Poplar Council Rates Rebellion as well. But she was at the time in quite a, by then she was in quite a marginal position in the labor movement and had, despite fighting for most of her adult life and votes for women, when she got the vote, she didn't use it in 1918 because she decided that the 1917 Russian Revolution meant that we shouldn't bother with Parliament anymore. Um, so there's a whole other interesting debate there about, um, you know, wh whether we should bother getting people elected to councils and parliaments and stuff like that. Do, do you just get sucked into the system? Or can you use it as an arena for change? Could have a whole other meeting on that, couldn't we? You could, and there's, a, there's another question come in, which is basically, do you see the councils of Poplar, which is now Tower Hamlets, doing the same sort of thing today? Well, I did mention Tower Hamlets Council in a very uh, negative way at the end of my talk, actually, because I, 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 I as I mentioned, it's really, to put it mildly sad, to see the Labour Council in the area that Poplar Council, and Tower Hamlets is Poplar plus some other bits, Stepney and Bethnal Green, um, it's very sad to see them doing the opposite of what Poplar did, because while we were talking about Poplar Council increasing wages, bringing in, uh, decasualising employment, being a good employer, as it were, bringing in a minimum wage. What Tower Hamlet's Council has been doing over the last year or so, as I understand it, is trying to fire and rehire large chunks of its workforce. Um, and that is... You know, that's what British Gas is doing to its workforce at the moment as well, which the GMB have been on strike about for five days. And I think it's, it's one of the nastiest and most threatening tactics the employers have, and we will see it used a lot in the coming period with the COVID-related um, austerity crisis, etc. Sack you and then bring you back on longer hours, worse conditions, lower pay. It's it's and the labor movement needs to draw a firm line against that happening. And how can you draw a firm line against that happening if you're doing it yourself? And that's what Tower Hamlet's yeah. Council is, it's doing it itself. So my solidarity is with uh, Unison and the other trade unions in Tower Hamlet's Council who are fighting against uh, the council doing this. Well, thank you, Janine. Thank you for a really riveting talk. We're, we're over time. I'm, my, my job is to try and limit us to the hour. We're already three minutes over that. I'd be sacked from the BBC, that's for sure. But we had so many interesting questions come in. We've had so many lovely uh, comments uh, in the chat box, which you've seen. I, I think you've uh, you kicked off 2021 in a great way for us. You've given us a lot to think about. Uh, I just want to give a plug to our next uh, Radical History chat, which is going to be on uh, Tuesday, the 9th of February. Uh, Nigel, have you got a graphic? Uh, Janine, could you stop sharing for a minute? Would that yeah, be okay? okay. I, was, I was just I reminding Nigel. people of our... Uh, I was just reminding no, it's people fine. of our... That's fine. I think, I think Nigel's got a graphic, hopefully, which he's going to put up, which is Mads Dresser, Atlantic Slavery and Its Legacy. That's our next Radical History Group's uh, Tuesday evening slot. Second Tuesday of every month, Mads Dresser has been involved a lot in researching the history of Atlantic slavery. Uh, she's a well-known expert on this topic. I'm looking forward to that one as well. Thank you very much, Nigel. Uh, there's Nigel himself. Thank you very much, Janine, for everything you've done for us tonight. It's what a great way well, to kick the year off. I, I couldn't have wished for a, a better start to the year than that. Uh, and you've really uh, given other speakers at this history school a lot to uh, to think about for the rest of the year. And I hope uh, I hope that one day we'll be able to have you come and chat to us in a tent in a field in Dorchus, in, in Dorset, which would be really nice. Okay, I look forward to that day. Uh, Nigel, did you want to say something? No, uh, thank you, Janine, for a, for a really informative and inspiring uh, hour. So thanks for joining us. And yes, like Les, 
look forward to seeing you in Toll Puzzle sometime soon. That'd be great. Okay, and I think you're talking at the 11th of February, on the 11th of February, Janine, for the RTC, RTUC for Heart Union. Yeah, yeah, yeah Reading. So there's, uh, so there's uh, definitely some people advertising that for you as well. So I'll Excellent. give you a full, full plug, Brilliant. all right? Good luck with that. Thanks right. very much, Janine. Thanks very much. Thank you to all, of, thank you to all of you for attending. Take care. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.